Hello there. The big question right now is, has Liz Truss got any fingernails left now after hanging on by them for the last few days? Now, if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe and then like and comment below. The cries of growth, growth, growth have now become growls to go, go, go. And the longer Liz Truss tries to hang on by her fingernails, the more she'll end up having to pay her manicurist. Although some Tory MPs are pleading with their mates to let her squat in number 10 to provide a period of calm while Jeremy Hunt tries to pull them out of their death spiral. And in order to achieve that, Jeremy Hunt has decided to gerrymander the Trussonomics mini budget and replace it with Huntonomics, which to me looks suspiciously like the sort of thing Labour was talking about. And according to the press, this is going to be the highest tax burden since 1950. However, the sounds of the screeching handbrake policy U-turns involved would do any action movie proud. And we now have a situation which only the terms like headless chickens and herding cats will suffice for the state the Tories are in. And Liz Truss did not help her own position today by failing to turn up in the House of Commons to answer an urgent question from the Leader of the Opposition. Something the left revelled in. Where is the Prime Minister? Starmer asked. The lady's not for turning up, he added. Now it was Penny Mordaunt that stepped in to face Keir Starmer. Are we being prepared for something? Anyway, the Tory Parliamentary Party is thoroughly divided. They've got no unity candidate to replace Truss with at the moment. So what are they going to do? Leave her there in number 10, twiddling her thumbs while Jeremy Hunt runs the country with no mandate? As Christopher Hope put it in the Telegraph, power is flowing from number 10 to number 11 like water from a leaky pipe. And who will attend the next international meetings of the UN and NATO? What would be the point of sending damaged goods in the form of Liz Truss to turn up and just sit there giving a convincing impression of a goldfish? And every PMQ's will be an embarrassing mockery. Take a look at this Wednesday's lunchtime event. The Tory MPs have already expressed their lack of confidence in their newly anointed leader. All that's missing is the official vote. It looks to me like the Tory party 1922 committee will have to get the rule book changed so they can somehow winkle truss out of Downing Street. Because at the moment, she's no confidence vote proof for nearly another year unless the chairman of that committee, Sir Graham Brady, marches into number 10 with the suspected pile of no-confidence letters he's already got and tells her to resign or he will change the rules. But what then? Another protracted leadership election to take us to Christmas with a caretaker prime minister who is unable to effect new business? Or somehow they get behind a single candidate and their team to prevent damaging delays and bypass the need for elections and hustings amongst the membership. In fact, there are reports that such changes to Tory party election rules are being mooted by MPs to only allow MPs to vote for the leader while they are in government. Something that would cause many Tory members to get their scissors out and cut up their membership cards. And across the country, the calls for a general election would become a crescendo. For how long could the Tories ignore that? No wonder Neela Starmer's Labour Party MPs are getting trained in how to act as ministers and run a government. Yes, it's being reported that Starmer's lot are training cabinet ministers on how to be in government as their party gets ready to take power. Wonder if it's the same training the Tories got. 
and they've been given a boost by one poll by Electoral Calculus that suggests that in a worst-case scenario, if an election were held tomorrow, Labour could end up with a majority of 364 seats, with the Tories only having 48, and the SNP with 52 seats being the official opposition. Not sure how realistic that is, but I bet there are many Tories now wondering how safe their safe seat really is. So while Labour is training and preparing for government, the Tories will be dusting off their CVs and wondering which second career courses they need to go on. Anyway, all the Labour lot need to know is how to borrow and how to tax, because they'll already have the massive spending plans ready to complete the circle. And one of them will probably involve building many, many more four-star hotels. All I can say is that the next time a Prime Minister is offered some cake, they need to decline it and run away as rapidly as possible. Now, two eco-loons climb on top of the Dartford Crossing Bridge and the police helpfully step in and do the protesters' job for them by stopping the traffic for safety reasons. But the US President Joe Biden has just made a declaration that we all need to hear. My younger sister used to be three years younger than me. Now she's 23 years younger. There's not a single solitary Biden man that is younger than any Biden woman. And, uh, and, and my wife, by the way, at a community college, my wife is teaching today. My wife is a full-time college professor at a community college. Did you get that and understand it? And now over to my channel co-pilot Richard, who has some very interesting musings on why house prices are still so out of reach for many. Thank you, Jeff, and good evening. For too long, house prices have defied gravity, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes, we know that they are more overvalued than an Ed Sheeran concert ticket. And yes, hardly anyone under the age of 32 can afford to buy a house, but nobody wants to talk about why. Many baby boomers and Generation Xers, like me, are lucky enough to own their own homes, and our respective generations have sat pretty for too long whilst our children's standard of living has fallen lower than Joe Biden trying to get up the floor after negotiating a set of stairs. Today's youngsters have to work every hour they can just to pay the rent, funded by zero-hour contract jobs, and live in a constant state of financial insecurity. And no, I don't accept the common view that that is just the way it is because of a free market, and they should suck it up. No, they find themselves in this dire situation because the market was prevented from having a complete collapse by the last Labour government. We needed that property correction, and that correction would have saved them from a life of rent servitude. Yet we, their elders, remain silent over the intergenerational wealth inequality, because that would mean we would have to face up to the uncomfortable fact that our financial stability and greed has come at the price of our own children's future. Yes, and I know they're an annoying generation of bloody idiots, but so are we. Okay, granted, not everyone who can remember Rainbow on television owns a house, but the average age for a first-time buyer is 32, so you can probably quite comfortably assume that the bottleneck is at least 10 years higher. Anyway, there are roughly 500,000 second homes in the UK. Probably a fair few of those are owned by MPs. And that is a lot of homes that first-time buyers will be priced out of. But second homes are a contributing factor, but not the main reason for today's ludicrous house prices. The real reason house prices are so high is because we pay taxes to keep them high. Yes, you do remember back to the credit crunch. Well, the banks were kept afloat with taxpayers' money, and interest rates were dropped so that the banks could remain liquid and keep churning out affordable loans. And yes, the taxpayers, <laughs> we all funded it. So, dear old Alistair Darling, and we, we don't hear much of him these days. Uh, is he dead? Ah, yes, Alistair Darling and the lovely, lovely Gordon Brown ensured that the nation got into unpayable debt long before Rishi Sunak decided to pay for everyone to go on holidays in their own living rooms, and thus house prices were sent on an ever-increasing trajectory, 
right up until the Bank of England's Andrew Bailey discovered gravity and began raising interest rates because apparently everyone had too much money, even though they didn't. And um, that was sending prices up. Uh, okay. So, with interest rates rising, our children may briefly be priced out of the market again, but they'll soon be able to enjoy lower house prices. Well, unless the government steps in again to prop up house prices. After all, we can't have bankers' wages falling and them losing their bonuses. And if you don't believe they would prioritise house prices at a time like this, just look at what Jeremy Hunt did today. He reversed nearly all of Quasi's mini-budget, but kept his stamp duty cut. Hmm, I wonder why. You see, this is a prime example of the disastrous effect of the state trying to control a free market. If the banks had been allowed to go under in the credit crunch, we would not be in this situation now, because there would have been a brutal house price correction. And house prices would be today, well, they would cost the same as today's deposit, which is the true value of a house. The rest is just a Ponzi scheme of borrowing. We didn't need bank bailouts. We needed a debt jubilee for anyone finding themselves in negative equity as a result of a property market crash. You see, long before the credit crunch, us Brits became obsessed with owning property, as if picking up the keys from the estate agent guaranteed eternal life and created a, a nirvana-like state of being in our two-up-two-down Shangri-Las. So us Brits, we all went mad and embarked upon a mission of increasing the value of our homes, then sell them on quickly to make a profit, or rent them out to fund the purchase of another property, and we all became property developers. To this day, if I hear the term property developer, my blood runs cold. However, the times they are a-changing, and all of a sudden, those who had placed their faith in an ever-rising property market are beginning to panic. As interest rates rise and a recession prices out the first-time buyers even further. And if it continues, the average first-time buyer will probably look something like this. Anyway, catch you all tomorrow night at one minute past six. Precisely. Back over to Jeff. Thank you for that, Richard. And finally, when subscribing, please don't forget to press that little bell and also select the All option, or you won't get any notifications when I publish a new video. And thank you all so much for taking the time to watch the show.